This is Space Time Series 22, Episode 12. Coming up on Space Time. New twists discovered in the expansion of the universe. Lunar nights found to be much colder than expected. And hundreds of tiny impact craters discovered peppering the hull of the Columbus Science Module aboard the International Space Station. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have uncovered what appears to be a glitch in the early expansion of the universe beyond that predicted by the standard model of cosmology. According to science's leading scenario for the evolution of the universe, the cosmos contains just a few percent of ordinary matter, the stuff that stars and planets and houses and people and dogs and cats are made out of. About a quarter of the cosmos is made up of a mysterious substance called dark matter, which is invisible and interacts only gravitationally with normal matter. What's left, the vast majority of the universe, in fact, some 75%, is made up of an even more mysterious substance called dark energy. It's a force causing the expansion of the universe to accelerate. This model of the universe is based on data collected over the last few decades. It comes from sources like the cosmic microwave background radiation, the very first light in the history of the cosmos, released 380,000 years after the Big Bang, and observed in unprecedented detail by the European Space Agency's Planck mission. Other data comes from supernova explosions, galaxy clusters, and the gravitational distortion imprinted by dark matter on distant galaxies. All this has been used to trace cosmic expansion in recent epochs of cosmic history, across the past 9 billion years or so. A new study, led by Guido Rizzoletti from the University of Friens in Italy and Elisabetta Luzzo from the University of Durham in the UK, has pointed to another type of cosmic tracer, quasars, that would fill part of the gap between those observations, measuring the expansion of the universe up to 12 billion years ago. Quasars are the brightly shining cores of galaxies. They're powerful jets of matter and energy generated by supermassive black holes accreting and feeding on matter from their surroundings at intense rates, burning brightly right across the electromagnetic spectrum. In fact, quasars are the brightest known objects in the universe. As matter falls onto the accretion disk of a black hole, it forms a whirling disk that radiates invisible and ultraviolet light. This light in turn heats up nearby electrons generating X-rays. Three years ago, Rizzoletti and Lusso realised that a well-known relationship between the ultraviolet and X-ray brightness of quasars could be used to estimate the distance to these sources, something that's been notoriously tricky in astronomy, and ultimately to probe the expansion history of the universe. Astronomical sources whose properties allow astronomers to gauge their distances are referred to as standard candles. The most notable of these are a class of thermonuclear or Type 1a supernova, these are generated by the catastrophic and spectacular demise of a white dwarf star after it's been sucking mass off a companion star, eventually reaching a magical figure known as the Chandrasekhar limit, roughly 1.4 times the mass of our Sun. Once a white dwarf reaches this Chandrasekhar limit, its core can no longer hold up against the mass crushing down on it, and it collapses, causing an incredible explosion bright enough to be seen across the universe. Because these explosions all happen at about the same mass, they generate roughly the same amount of brightness. And so astronomers can use that brightness as a standard candle to determine cosmic distances. It's a bit like looking at a row of streetlights down the road. Even though you know they're all the same brightness, the ones further away seem dimmer. And so by knowing how dim the streetlight is, or how dim the explosion of the supernova was, you can work out how far away it is. It was observations of these supernovas in the 1990s which revealed that the universe's rate of expansion out from the Big Bang has been accelerating over the past few billion years. Using quasars as standard candles has great potential since astronomers can observe them out to much greater distances than Type 1a supernovae. So that means they can be used to probe much earlier epochs in the history of the universe. With a sizable sample of quasars in hand, the authors have now put their method into practice and the results have been somewhat intriguing. Digging into the European Space Agency's XMM Newton archive, the authors collected X-ray data from over 7,000 quasars, combining them with ultraviolet observations from the ground-based Sloan Digital Sky Survey. 
They also used a new set of data, specially obtained with XMM Newton in 2017, to look at very distant quasars, observing them as they were when the universe was only about 2 billion years old. Finally, they complemented the data with a small number of even more distant quasars, as well as some relatively nearby ones, observed using NASA's Chandra and Swift X-ray observatories. Rizzoletti says such a large sample enabled them to scrutinise the relationship between X-ray and ultraviolet emissions from quasars in painstaking detail. This, in turn, allowed them to greatly refine their technique to estimate cosmic distance. In fact, the new XMM-Newton observations of distant quasars are so good that the team were able to identify two distinct groups. About 70% of the quasars shine brightly in low-energy X-rays, while the remaining 30% emit lower amounts of X-rays that are characterised by higher energies. For the further analysis, they only kept their earlier group of sources, in which the relationship between X-ray and ultraviolet emission appears clearer. After skimming through all the data and bringing the sample down to about 1,600 quasars, the authors were left with the very best observations, leading to very robust estimates as to the distance of these quasars, allowing these sources to be used to investigate the universe's expansion. Lusso says when they combine the quasar samples that are spanning over 12 billion years of cosmic history with more local samples of Type 1a supernovae covering the past 8 billion years or so, they found similar results in the overlapping epochs. However, in the earlier phases, which the authors could only probe with quasars, they found a discrepancy between the observed evolution of the universe and what would be predicted based on the standard model of cosmology. Looking into this previously poorly explored period of cosmic history with the help of quasars, the authors have revealed a possible tension in the standard model of cosmology, an anomaly which might require the addition of extra parameters in order to reconcile the data with the theory. The authors say one possible solution would be to invoke an evolving dark energy with a density that increases as time goes by. Now it's worth pointing out this observation, if it becomes a model, would also alleviate another tension that's kept cosmologists fairly busy lately, that concerning the Hubble constant, the current rate of cosmic expansion. That discrepancy was found between estimates of the Hubble constant in the local universe based on supernova data and independently on galaxy clusters and those based on the Planck observations of the cosmic microwave background radiation from the early universe. So the observations and the model coming from it are quite interesting because they could solve two puzzles at once. But scientists admit they'll need to take many more possible models into consideration in more detail before they can really solve this cosmological conundrum. The next step will be to look for even more quasars to further refine their results. Additional clues will also come from the European Space Agency's Euclid mission. That's slated for launch in 2022 to explore the past 10 billion years of cosmic expansion and investigate the nature of dark energy. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. China's Chang'e 4 mission to the rarely seen far side of the moon has found that lunar nights there are far colder than expected. The lander's tiny six-wheeled U-22 rover has measured lunar nighttime temperatures of minus 190 degrees Celsius. The data was then sent back to Earth by the Chang'e 4 lander after it woke up following two weeks in programmed hibernation. The hibernation mode was designed to help it cope with the freezing cold lunar night temperatures. The moon is tidally locked to the Earth with the same side always facing our planet. So, as the moon orbits around the Earth every 29 days, it results in lunar nights and days lasting just over two weeks each. Mission managers say the cold temperatures aren't just a curiosity. It could be an indication that geology on the far side of the moon is, as suspected, very different from that on the near side. The temperature difference could be due to differences in the lunar salt composition. Scientists already know there are great differences in the terrain, structure and age of rocks between the lunar near and far sides. The far side is very mountainous, it's rugged and thickly dotted with impact craters, giving it a very different appearance to the large, flat, mare-covered near side. About 60% of the near side is covered by mare basalt. In fact, of the 22 lunar mares, 19 are located on the near side. The moon's far side, on the other hand, is covered by lunar highland and anthracite. Scientists don't understand the reasons for this geological asymmetry. It implies that the lunar crust is thicker on the far side than the near side. But as to why that would be the case, that's a mystery. And that's where the Chungi 4 mission comes in. It'll hopefully provide scientists with new insights into the geological asymmetry history and formation of the moon. 
Chung'e 4 became the first spacecraft to land on the lunar far side, touching down in the massive 2,500 kilometre wide, 13 kilometre deep South Pole Atkin Basin impact crater on January the 3rd. The Atkin Basin is the largest known impact crater in the solar system. Because it always faces away from the moon, the lunar far side is difficult to study. Landing on the far side places any probe out of radio contact with mission managers back on Earth. China's solution involved first placing a communications satellite named Magpie Bridge into a gravitationally stable position in space known as the Lunar Lagrange 2 position, some 65,000 kilometres above the lunar far side surface, from where it can relay communications between the Earth and any far side lunar lander. This was then followed by the launch of the Chengyi 4 aboard a Long March 3B rocket from the Zhaichang Satellite Launch Center in southwestern China's Sichuan province on December the 7th. Named after the moon goddess in Chinese mythology, Chengyi 4 was originally built as a backup for the 1,200 kilogram Chengyi 3 lunar lander, which touched down on the Bay of Rainbows on the lunar near side back on December the 14th, 2013. As for the robotic rover U2, well, it translates to Jade Rabbit, a companion for the moon goddess. To find out more, Andrew Dunkley is speaking with astronomer Dr Fred Watson. The Chang'e 4 lander, which uh, hit the dark side of the moon not so long ago, and uh, getting ready to do what it's supposed to do, which is very exciting. So what's happened? This is the fourth mission in the Chinese Chang'e series. The idea of preparing the way, I think, for Chinese taikonauts, as they're called, to perhaps walk on the moon sometime within the next decade. But uh, Chang'e 4 carries on board a little rover. You might remember that Chang'e 3 also had on board a rover, which was called U2, U2 meaning Jade Rabbit. And the Jade Rabbit was uh, designed to rove over the lunar surface on the near side of the, the moon. But actually, I think after only 40 hours, the rover failed to rove. It did still have all its scientific capabilities and actually made observations over a number of years of the uh, ver various aspects of the moon and indeed the ultraviolet sky uh, as seen from the moon. But it couldn't rove. So now we have <laughs> something called U22 because it's number two in the U2 series. So yeah, U22. It's going to get confusing. <laughs> Is it not? Uh, has already been deployed very soon after the landing. Um, we saw images of U-22 rolling off its little landing platform, a couple of ramps there, towards a directly facing a small crater. Not only have they chosen the difficult far side of the moon to land on, but they've also gone into perhaps one of the most interesting areas of the moon. And this is why the science that might come back from the Chang'e 4 mission is going to be very valuable. That's something called the Aitken South Pole Basin. It's a very deep depression on the moon's far side, as, it, as its name implies, near the South Pole. The terrain there is pretty rugged. And so they've faced a challenge in getting into that basin. There is a crater in there with a relatively flat bottom. It's called the Von Karman Crater, and that's where they've landed. That's perhaps it's a great idea to try and land somewhere flat because landing in mountainous terrain when you're out of effectively out of radio contact directly is difficult to do. But they've done it successfully. Just to talk a little bit about the science that we might get back from this, as I explained, it's in the South Pole Aitken Basin. That probably was formed very early in the history of the moon by a, a large object impacting the moon. At that time, the late heavy bombardment, there were all kinds of things charging around. And yeah. something big clouded the moon and made this depression. And the likelihood is that when it did that, it brought up to the surface some of the lower mantle rocks of the then infant moon. And so if we can sample the geology of this area, then we might find out things about the history of the moon and certainly the early history of the moon that we don't already know. So that's one of the really exciting aspects of this. It carries a number of instruments on board, including ground penetrating radar. There is a German experiment on board. It's called the Lunar Lander Neutrons and Dosimetry Experiment. That's basically looking at, well, as its name implies, <laughs> neutrons and the radar radiation that's coming from the lunar rocks and soil. Great stuff in terms of understanding more about the history of this part of the lunar surface. So that is one component of the science. Another is very interesting to astronomers because we think the dark side of the moon, the far side of the moon, might actually be the most radio quiet place in our bit of the solar system because all radio signals from Earth are blocked off by the moon itself. So there is actually a set of antennas being carried on board the uh, spacecraft, which will 
actually set set the scene and give us ideas of what level of radio signal or radio background there is in this rather intriguing part of the moon. And the final experiment is the little biosphere. A miniature biosphere contains silkworms and then seeds of potatoes and, uh, and cress, which is hoped to be self-sustainable. That's Dr Fred Watson, an astronomer with the Department of Science, speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister programme, Space Nuts. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Hundreds of tiny impact craters have been discovered, peppering the external hull of the European Space Agency's Columbus Science Module, which forms one of the major components of the International Space Station. The damage was uncovered during the first external survey by the European Space Agency of the module since its launch over a decade ago. The impact craters are caused by micrometeoroids and bits of space debris. Mission managers used the space station's 17-metre robotic Canadarm3 to undertake the survey. The Columbus Crater Survey was requested by scientists focusing on space safety and security. The team found several hundred small impact craters, visible as tiny dents in the laboratory's outer casing. These would have been produced by very small pieces of either natural or artificial debris, typically smaller than a millimetre in size, hitting the module at orbital speeds. Mind you, if the bits had been larger than, say, a centimetre in size, they would have caused significant damage, possibly even the destruction of the module. Scientists say these little dents in the outer hull of Columbus show how the space around the Earth isn't really empty at all. The study allows scientists to better understand the density of human-made debris particles in the orbital altitude of the space station, about 400 kilometres above the Earth's surface. They'll then be able to compare that to the natural micrometeorite density near Earth. Both these figures are important for constructing new models to help scientists better understand the risks of space debris and micrometeorites marauding through space. Time now to turn our eyes to the skies and check out the celestial sphere for February on Skywatch. February is the second month of the year in both the Julian and Gregorian calendars. It's also the shortest month of the year, the only month to have less than 30 days. The month is 28 days in common years and 29 days in leap years, with a quadrennial 29th day being called the leap day. The additional day every fourth year is needed to keep the calendar year synchronised with the astronomical year. Because seasons and astronomical events don't repeat in whole numbers of days, calendars that have the same number of days in each year will tend to drift over time with respect to the event that the year is supposed to track. By inserting an additional day into every fourth year, that drift can be corrected. These extra days occur in years which are multiples of four, with the exception of years divided by 100, but not by 400. Sky watchers in the Southern Hemisphere may be lucky enough to catch sight of the occasional meteor associated with the Alpha and Beta Centaurids meteor showers. As their names suggest, they appear to radiate out from the direction of the constellation Centaurus as two separate streams, although they rarely produce more than one or two meteors an hour. They're peaking right now, and the best time to see them would be in the early hours just before dawn. Looking north and high in the sky this time of year is the famous constellation of Orion the Hunter. In Greek mythology, Orion boasted that he could kill every animal on Earth. So the Earth goddess Gaia sent a scorpion to kill him and save the animals. Orion was stung on the shoulder, but the healer Ophiuchus saved Orion and crushed the scorpion. Both Orion and the Scorpion were placed in the heavens to play out the story each year, with Scorpius the Scorpion rising in the east as the defeated Orion sets in the west. Then, when Ophiuchus crushes Scorpius, forcing him to sit in the west, Orion is revived so he can again rise in the east. Variations of the same story appear in other cultures, including ancient Egypt, where Orion is known as Osiris, god of the underworld and of regeneration. To those listening to the show in the Southern Hemisphere, Orion appears upside down, with the sword on his belt pointing upwards. But no matter which hemisphere you're listening to us from, the scorpion sting is still represented by the red supergiant Betelgeuse, or Betelgeuse, on Orion's shoulder or armpit. Betelgeuse is a variable star located approximately 643 light years away, and it's expected to erupt as a supernova well, virtually any time now. It's a huge star. If Betelgeuse were at the centre of our solar system, its surface would extend past the main asteroid belt, wholly engulfing the orbits of Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars. 
Calculations of its mass range from slightly under 10 to a little bit over 20 times that of the Sun. Diagonally opposite Betelgeuse is the blue supergiant star Rigel, one of Orion's knees. Rigel is located some 863 light years away. It has some 23 times the mass and a staggering 279,000 times the luminosity of our Sun. Rigel is part of a triple or possibly even quadruple star system with three or four small companion stars. The primary star Rigel A has now exhausted its core hydrogen. It's dropped off the main sequence and swollen out to between 79 and 115 times the Sun's radius. It pulsates quasi-periodically and is classified as an Alpha Cygni variable star. Rigel B is a spectroscopic binary system consisting of two main sequence spectral type B blue-white stars, estimated to have 2.9 and 3.9 times the mass of our Sun, respectively. Rigel B also appears to have a very close visual companion Rigel C, which is almost identical in appearance. One of the best known features on Orion's sword is Messier or M42, the great nebula in Orion. Located some 1,344 light years away, it's the closest massive star forming ridge into Earth, some 24 light years across, and containing about 2,000 times the mass of our Sun. The Orion Nebula has revealed much about the process of how stars and planetary systems are formed out of gravitationally collapsing clouds of molecular gas and dust. Astronomers have directly observed protoplanetary disks, brown dwarfs, intense and turbulent motions of gas, and the photoionizing effects of massive nearby stars in the nebula. OK, looking now to the west of Orion's belt, and you'll see a V-shaped group of stars which represent the head of Taurus the Bull, who in Greek mythology was changed by the god Zeus to carry Princess Europa off to Crete. The V is also part of a large open star cluster known as the Hades. One of Taurus's eyes is a giant spectral type K orange star called Audubon, or the Follower. It's not too far away from the Sun, just 65 light years, and is about one and a half times the Sun's mass. Audubon has evolved off the main sequence, having exhausted the hydrogen in its core. The collapse of the center of the star into a degenerate helium core has now ignited a shell of hydrogen outside the core. The Audubon system is thought to contain a number of Jupiter-sized planets. Audubon follows the Pleiades or Seven Sisters across the sky, a spectacular open star cluster visible to the northwest of the V. Still located in the constellation Taurus, the Pleiades are one of the nearest and youngest open star clusters to the Earth, located just 443 light years away. Greek mythology tells us that Orion fell in love with the Seven Sisters and pursued them across the skies. Eventually, the god Zeus turned both Orion and the Pleiades into stars. Interestingly, a very similar story is told in Aboriginal Dreamtime culture by the people of the Great Victoria Desert region near Aldea in outback South Australia. According to their Dreamtime, Orion is a young male hunter who chases but never catches the Pleiades, who are a group of seven young women. In Orion's right hand is a club filled with magic fire, represented by the red giant star Betelgeuse. However, the Pleiades' older sister, represented by the Hades star cluster, taunts Orion, standing in front of him. She then defensively lifts her foot, which is the star Audubon, and is also filled with fire magic. This causes Orion great humiliation, putting out his fire, allowing the Seven Sisters to escape. One of the interesting facts about this ancient story is that it accurately describes the variability of Betelgeuse, which brightens and fades over a period of about 400 days. The Pleiades or Seven Sisters story is also remarkably similar to legends found in many other cultures around the world, cultures which haven't had any contact with each other for tens of thousands of years. The Pleiades' seven brightest stars can be easily seen with the unaided eye as long as you're in a dark area, hence the Seven Sisters' nickname. But this spectacular open cluster actually consists of well over a hundred stars. All you'll need to see them is a decent backyard telescope. Following Orion's belt to the east brings us to Sirius, one of the nearest and brightest stars in the sky. Located just 7.8 light years away, Sirius is a binary star system consisting of a spectral type A white star orbited by a white dwarf. It's the brightest star in the night sky and the brightest star in the constellation of Canis Major, the Great Dog. In Greek mythology, Sirius was the dog star and the canine companion of Orion the Hunter. 
To the ancient Egyptians, Sirius was known as the god Anubis, lord of the underworld, who had the head of a dog and who invented embalming, the funeral rites, and who guided one through the underworld to judgment, where he attended the scales during the weighing of the heart, to determine one's fate in the afterlife. Later, Anubis was replaced by Osiris as lord of the underworld. Sirius also represents the goddess Isis, and ancient Egyptians initially based their calendar on the star's yearly motion across the sky. Turning to the south now, looking high in the southern skies, you'll see the star Canopus, a white supergiant located 313 light years away, the second brightest star in the night sky. In Greek mythology, Canopus was the helmsman of the Greek king Menelaus, and the brightest star in the constellation Carina, which represents the keel of the boat used by Jason and the Argonauts in their quest for the Golden Fleece. Jonathan Nally, editor of Sky and Telescope magazine, joins us now to continue our tour of the February night skies. G'day, Stuart. I'll tell you what, um, you know, stargazing really depends on the weather, and the weather's been a bit crazy in certain parts of uh, the world, hasn't it? Here in Australia, we've had this amazing heat spell for a while. It's just been terrible. I mean, clear skies and things, but the heat's just been awful. And our poor friends up in North America, or, or large parts of North America, with the terrible... Um, Polar vortex cold snap they've had there yeah i mean that's that's, that's certainly cold a snap it's weather, colder than antarctica i know yeah <laughs> yeah i know it's incredible isn't it so i hope everyone was inside rugged up i don't think there would be much astronomy going on but anyhow for us in the southern hemisphere this time of year it's, it's still summer of course it's beginning to fade a little bit as we get into uh february with the temperatures cooling down a little bit we hope fingers crossed but still great stargazing weather you've got warm nights and clear skies lots of great constellations and other things to see including the Milky Way, which is, as we've discussed on the program many times, it's the Milky Way is our galaxy seen from the inside, and it looks like a faint band of light stretching across the sky at this time of year, stretching across the whole sky from south to north in the evening time after the sky's got dark. So, yeah, the, the milky appearance uh, of the Milky Way is just from all the millions of stars that are too faint and too far away to be picked out individually by the naked eye. You get a telescope onto them and you can see lots and lots of them, but combined they make up this sort of milky appearance through the sky and amazingly when you look at the milky way every single star you can see is really close by i mean it's just a on a map of the milky way it's just a really tiny dot on, in the orion arm and that covers everything we can possibly see not using big telescopes the scale is just unbelievable it's unbelievable but people are often surprised to find out how few stars we can actually see with the naked eye, you look up and you think, oh, there's millions of stars, whatever. There aren't. Uh, there are mil billions and billions of stars in the Milky Way, but o virtually all of those are too faint to be seen with the naked eye, too far away to be made out. Uh, all the ones that we can see with the naked eye, as you say, are close, and there aren't that many of them across the whole 360 degrees of the sky in every direction, including half the sky that you can't see right now. Well, of course, we can only see half of the sky at any particular time. There are less than six, uh, fewer than 6,000 stars. Uh, in total mm. that can be seen with the naked eye. So uh, that means that because we can only see one half of the sky at a time, and the other side, other, other side of the sky, the other half of the sky is on the other side of the Earth where it's daytime right now. So you're seeing no more, you know, less than 3,000 stars at any particular time. Um, and, and, but yet you, think, you look up and you think, you see, oh, there's millions and millions of them, particularly if you're a city dweller and you go out into the country where the sky's are really dark and you see all these new stars for the first time, you think, wow, there are millions of them, but there aren't. So as you say, yeah, yeah all the ones um, that we can see are very close by in galactic terms, and that just shows you the size of our galaxy, basically. Mm. Now, along the Milky Way are a lot of the famous constellations. Constellations, of course, in this day and age, uh, don't mean anything scientifically. They just sort of join the dots affairs, uh, making up shapes. A lot of them date back to ancient times when uh, people uh, put their mythological creatures and characters up in the sky. And then during the science, early scientific era, some of these sort of cartographers, celestial cartographers of the time, put into the sky shapes of amazing new inventions like uh, the pump and the triangle and those sorts of things, you the know, and the telescope. Oh, that's the Harbour Bridge, isn't it? Hanger. That's the Harbour Bridge. So uh, anyway, so the yeah, constellations, they're just drawing the dots, dots affairs this day and age. But the constellations that you can see at the moment through the Milky Way this time of year, starting right down in the south for us here in Australia, uh, we've got the Southern Cross. Uh, it's sort of lying on its left-hand side, still above the horizon. And as the night goes on, you'll see it climb higher and higher in the sky and get a bit more upright. Above the Southern Cross are three constellations that used to be one before it was split. It used to be called Argo Navis, which was the ship of the Argonauts, the famous myth mythology, but was divided a long time ago into three. They broke the ship up into three, the constellation Vela, the sails, Carina, the hull and the keel, 
and Puppis, the poop deck. Now, beyond Puppis, if we go beyond Puppis and sort of keep going north, high overhead for people around the latitudes of Australia is the constellation Canis Major, which is the constellation of a large dog, Canis Major. And yes, there's also a Canis Minor, a small dog constellation, just not too far away from that one. Canis Major, of course, is famous for Sirius, the brightest star we can see in the night sky. Nice and bright, huge big beacon, um, can be seen beautifully here down in the south. There's the constellation Orion, the hunter, which we've spoken about many, many times on this, uh, this program. Still a great time to see it this time of year. As we've said before, when Orion's up, for us it's summer, for our friends in the Northern Hemisphere it's winter. That's one of the ways you can tell what, what season it is. And beyond Orion, uh, further north of Orion, for people here in the Southern Hemisphere, we get the constellations of Gemini and Taurus, which are full of great things to see. Um, if you've got a pair of binoculars, you can see star clusters and all sorts of stuff through those two constellations. On either side of the Milky Way, we've, we're talking about the constellations through the Milky Way, but either side, the sky is a lot darker and far more bare. There aren't many bright stars and things, and, and there are large, sparse constellations, and you think, well, there's not much there to see. Well, for those who have a telescope, backyard telescope, there are plenty of things to see in that part of the sky, or well, these parts of the sky, because um, that's where all the galaxies live. Deep sky objects galore. Now, as far as the planets go, there are four to be seen this month. In the evening sky, we have Mars in the northwest after sunset fairly easy to spot you really can't miss it it's a sort of a, a ruddy orange red color and medium brightness um, so it's, it's fairly it's fairly distinct you know with its color three of the other bright planets uh, are morning objects so you've got to be an early riser up before dawn they'll be visible in the east before sunrise and, and uh, as the morning goes on they'll get higher and higher before the sun comes up Venus and Jupiter uh, rising after 3 a.m with Saturn following about an hour later. Now, of the three, Venus, Jupiter and Saturn, Venus will be the brightest of the three, really bright. Jupiter is the next one in brightness and Saturn is the fainter of the three. So you should be able to see those fairly easily. They'll be in a line um, above, the north, above the eastern horizon before dawn. And that's Stuart, is the uh, sky for February this year. That's Jonathan Nally, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And that's the show for now. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 